We all want to get a good deal, right? Well, if you get a great deal on beef, you may just be buying pink slime instead. We know one thing. We know the price is rising in the stores for meat that we buy. And we know that ranchers are not making any more than they were. How is this happening? Well, I was able to catch up to a guy by the name of Mike Calicrate and have a conversation with him down in Wyoming. You're probably going to be a little bit shocked about what you buy in the grocery store and what impact what you buy has on the great land of the United States. What, what is pink slime and how is it being used by... Well, pink slime is really a byproduct of the box beef industry, which is the big meat packers that slaughter most of the 85% of the cattle in the country are slaughtered by these big meat packers that produce a box beef product. It, and that's compared to carcass business, you know, 50 years ago. Now it's box beef. Well, so, so carcass beef would be like the cow is hung in a full carcass with no hide on it and everything. Right. Versus being in it like cut up in a box right off the bat, right? That's right, right off the bat. So within 24 to 36 hours, an animal that is slaughtered at a big slaughterhouse that might do 6,000 animals a day is put into a box. So it's cut up into the primal pieces, the smaller pieces, not the final retail cuts, but the middle primal cuts. And, the, and what happens is, as a result of these fast chains and experienced workers, we're getting a lot of pathogens, contamination on the meat. Well, the problem is, we're not dry aging, which is a natural uh, intervention for pathogens. Uh, we're putting it right into a plastic bag and putting it in a box. Well, when you open up the plastic bag, you end up with the pathogens now starting to grow and wake up and, and, and become dangerous. And so what happens in the, in the slaughterhouse is they, they do this trimming on the outside of the carcass. Well, that's where pathogens would be. Well, with the pink slime or lean, finely textured beef, as it's all, also known as, <laughs> LFTB, they're basically taking those trimmings and, and cooking them and spinning off the fat. And what's left is not necessarily muscle. It's connective tissue and stuff like that. It's pretty ugly. And then they pelletize that and sell it to hamburger processors, sausage makers, to add as a cheap filler. And that's what pink slime is. And, and during, what, what year was it? 2006? I think, well, whatever year it was, ABC News did a story on this product and it just blew up. And there was a housewife mom in San Antonio, Texas that put out a petition saying, this is in our school lunch programs and it shouldn't be and I'm not very happy about it. Well, she ended up with 250,000 signatures right away and ABC News got on it and exposed the whole thing and interviewed the USDA scientists that thought it was a terrible thing, that it was even in our food system. It should be just a rendering product that should go into pet food or something like that. And, and uh, ABC News got a hold of it and blew it up. And, and then they also got sued by this company, Beef Products Incorporated. And the company that's creating the pink slime or? The company that's creating the pink slime. Okay. Along with advanced meat recovery and sure. other things like mechanically separated meat and other things that they, that they do. And, and so, and so it, it basically blew up and, and, and BPI, Beef Products Incorporated, didn't really produce much after that for a while until the ABC case was settled. They got a bunch of money and now it's, and, and of course USDA decided that it didn't need to be labeled. Well, that's a big mistake. I mean. So USDA decided that it didn't need to be put on the meat that this is concludes Pink slime, is that what you're talking about? That's right. Yeah, okay, so they're yeah. saying, no, you, you don't need to know that you're eating pink slime. Yeah, Joanne Smith was the undersecretary at the time, very, very big meat packer friendly. And she said, look, if it's pink, it's meat. And so they took the label off of the off of the product, so nobody even knew, I mean, as if mm -hmm. they would anyway, LFTB. No, nobody knows. Nobody, I mean, you don't know anyway, but, mm -mm. but still, it, it needs to be on the product. Better yet, it shouldn't even be produced. It's, I mean, think about what does anhydrous ammonia do? And it's a it's an intervention. It's 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 a pathogen killer. Well, anhydrous ammonia is really hey, unfriendly. I mean, it's 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 a terrible product mm -hmm. to breathe in. I mean, the reason he's mentioning anhydrous ammonia is because the companies that make finely textured meat or pink slime actually wash the meat as part of the process in anhydrous ammonia to kill the pathogens. We it, anhydrous ammonia turns living soil into dead dirt. I mean, but it's the cheapest form of nitrogen, and it's what a lot of farmers are putting on the soil. 
but it, since it kills soil, it also kills pathogens on meat. But what does it do to your stomach, your gut, your digestive system as a human that, that, that eats this stuff? Well, where's the gastroenterologist? Why aren't they saying something about this? Well, I, I, was, I talk about this quite a bit. This, our medical community in the United States, not necessarily trying to not do the right thing, but it's a dollar amount deal. So they, you make a lot more money just basic bare bones. You make a lot more money off somebody who's sick than you do if somebody's healthy. Right. Or trying to keep them healthy. So the system there is not really the directed towards the right direction, maybe I would say. So now you're talking about this, this, uh, what does this, how does this pink slime being in meat, creating filler that's cheap, how does that directly affect a rancher that's in Wyoming? Because, because I know when you're a customer, I know a lot of customers of beef. They want to actually promote ranching at this point. They want to buy beef directly from the rancher. But when you buy beef in the store that says U.S. made, how, how does that happen and how does that affect directly the rancher? Well, pink slime is just part of the problem. The, the bigger, actually bigger problem is the imported meat. So we've got a lot of really cheap imports that could come into this country from as many as 22 different countries. And it's really inexpensive. It's cheap. Well, the big guys in the middle, the big packers, processors, they're going to these countries like Brazil and Paraguay and, and New Zealand and Australia and various places around the world, and they're buying product below cost of production. They're beating those producers up just like they do us. And then they export that into the United States. Right now, old cows and bulls out of Uruguay, uh, the cheap trim from the, from the JBS and Marfrig plants that are in South America, can come in here below two dollars a pound. Well, that's which, which uh, from being here, that's that's a that's not possible not, for us to. Not, well, the break well, it's even, possible, but not break even. The break I mean, even here is going to be a lot closer to five dollars on, mm -hmm. on ground beef with two dollar fat cattle, and and so they go to these foreign countries and they and these processors, these ground beef makers like Empirical Foods, which is now the new name for Beef Processors Incorporated, they they can buy the imported stuff. It, it, below $2, add the waste fat from the big packers that are their friends, that they're located near in Garden City, Kansas, for example, and add in the pink slime at 10 to 12%. And, and man, they've got, a, they've got a really cheap product, well below $2 in cost of production. And so they'll go out there and they'll private label that for Cisco, for US Foods, for Shamrock, for any of the big food service companies. And they, they would do it for smaller operations too, but they now private label that. So they manufacture it, put your name on it, and ship it into commerce at $2.50 final sale to the restaurant. But it, the thing that, that I'm catching about what you're saying is it doesn't say this meat is from Brazil, right? That's right. What, what does it say on it? Does it say it's made in product, the U.S.? It says it's product of the USA because USDA allows foreign meat to come into the country and upon just repackaging call it product of the USA. That's as fraudulent as you can get. And USDA is supposed to be enforcing truth in labeling. And they're the biggest violator. So when you're, when you're buying, I just want you to be clear about this. When you're buying beef, you as the consumer, you're buying beef that says the US, that doesn't mean it's from the US. If, it's, if it can be super cheap beef, it's not from here. It's packaged here with somebody's label on it, right? right. But it's from it's cheap beef from somewhere else in many cases. So you can't trust just like going into a store and saying, oh, this is U.S. beef. But what we've done for the last 50 years is convince people that shopping is a good thing. You know, yeah, this getting the best price, this this, mm -hmm. this aggressive price shopping consumerism. It's like a sport, you know, and, and all we've done is is cut our own throats. You need to be going out and be willing to pay more to a local rancher, a local producer of, of food and make sure he's getting enough to stay in business and enough to make his kids want to come back and take their place at some point. Otherwise, we're going to be dependent upon the biggest corporations on the planet to eat, and they're not benevolent. They are not going to give their food away. They're not going to care about you when you're living under a bridge. Mm -mm. But you got to build community, and I say build community around local food, but recognize that the cheaters are in the marketplace that are getting away with misinforming consumers, and, and it, it just needs to stop. But the first thing we have to do is, is give it up. Give up the aggressive price shopping consumerism. Stop being that consumer.
and think more about becoming a citizen. What should your community look like? What can I do to help my community, to help my neighbor, to make the place we live better? If we'll do that, we'll avoid a lot of this terrible stuff like the imported $2 trim and blended with the fat and the, and the pink slime. We just won't eat it anymore. We won't be tricked the way that we are today. So one of the things is, is if you want to support ranchers, if you want to support local ranchers, there's got to be ways for you to find that, that product, right? right. And so in and, and communities in, so the, I, I would ask you this, what's the importance of saving small communities in the U.S.? There's certain areas in Montana, Wyoming, that are, are growing in population. And the little towns out in eastern Montana, Wyoming, places like that are dying off because the ranches there, they, they can't make any money. A lot of their kids don't want to stay. Why is that important to consumers in the long run to keep their ranchers on the ground? These are the food producing places. This is where cows eat grass and turn it into beef that we get to eat. If we continue to allow the big meat cartel, which includes the big packers, the big retailers and food service companies, to continue to steal from these ranchers, they're not gonna be there. And so we're not gonna have the food that they produce, but we're also, the economy's not gonna have the wealth that they, that they create when a cow eats grass and has a calf and turns into a hamburger on your plate. We've gotta support these people. And they're the stewards of our land. And a cow grazing grass is a carbon sink. A cow eating grass, especially in a well-managed grazing program, can, can take four times the carbon out of the air that, that an otherwise poorly managed operation would, would do. And, and so it's, it, from an environmental perspective, a cow has got to be in the environment. You know, when we, when we first came here, when the Native Americans were the only ones here, how many buffalo? Yeah, so we're saying million buffalo or yeah, whatever. Who knows? Thirty to sixty yeah. million or more. Nobody yeah. really knows, but it was yeah. lots and lots. Yeah, yes. and, now, and now we have, you know, we've got twenty-eight million cows. I mean, it's nothing. And and if you drive a lot, if you drive up through Wyoming into Montana, where are the cows? Yes, we had a drought. We did. But the prices have been so low for so long that now when the price does finally come back on calves because we've just pushed it too far too long with low prices, we can't rebuild the herd. So now what's gonna to happen to the grass? It's gonna burn. We're gonna end yep. up with some fires that are gonna be epic fires because of the lack of grazing livestock, not only on it's these okay. ranches. That'll be blamed on global warming. Yeah. But so now the price is up <laughs> on the price is up to three dollars. Okay, which on is calf. great. Uh, we're, so we're now the ranchers can sell the calf to the market for three dollars, which is almost double what they were getting. So you say this is a great thing or not? Oh, it, it's a great relief, but I've been around a while. I've just seen this happen over and over again, and every time it does, it eliminates more people, especially that guy in the middle that buys the calf and hopes to sell it to a packer. He's buying in a more competitive market than he's selling in. That is a recipe for failure. So, so kind of explain that. So how is, okay, first of all, if you don't understand the process, everybody asks me, like, so the price is going up in the grocery store for beef, but so the ranchers should be making a ton of money, but the ranchers aren't making any more money. So why is that? Where's the money going? Well, the rancher is just a cost to be reduced to the big meat cartel. Uh, and, and so the rancher produces it in a calf. Like in Montana, mm -hmm. you'll sell a 500 pound calf off a cow in the fall. That calf then will go to a feeder somewhere, a background, or maybe they're in Nebraska or Iowa, somewhere where there's corn growing and then they feed that calf. And some of them are gonna finish that calf up into, the, up into a full weight slaughter animal. And, and some of them are just gonna grow it and sell it off to a feedlot that does that. But you've got these middlemen that buy the calf, that comes off the cow, they're really good husbandmen. They know how to treat a sick animal, they know how to create an environment where the calf is happy and healthy and doesn't get sick. Well, those guys are gone. We've lost 85,000 of those operations. Because of, they're not making any money either. They can't. They cannot make it because they're, they're. They can't make it because they're buying calves in a more competitive market than they're selling their their finished product in. And so how how is why is the market at the top not competitive? Because but, Walmart pushes down on the packer and the packer pushes down on the cattle feeder. So and, who's and who's cattle, actually making the profit? Because over the course of the last what thirty years, you got 
lots of inflation going on. Right. So the, the rancher's not making that. I can see that in the pricing. Right. So who, who the, is the making that? The retailer's making the money. The Walmart, Kroger, Albertson Safeway, Costco, they're making the money. They've, they've captured a huge share. It used to be the packer was kind of in control. They could control the price they were paying for livestock and also dictate to the retailer. Well, now the retailer has gotten bigger than the packer, more powerful than the packer, and the retailer is able to push down on the packer. I often talk about how the big retailer is robbing the bank and the packer is driving the getaway car. Well, the packer's got the market power to pay less for livestock, but he doesn't have the market power to sell the box beef higher. And, mm -hmm. and so they're right. in the middle, but have done extremely well, way better than they ever should have done, at the, but the producer's losing. And, and they're just a cost to be reduced. They're the course of least resistance for the big retailer and the packer to increase their profits. So out of the course of, over the course of these years that we've seen all this inflation, you're t I saw a chart in there where you're talking about the, the price of, what do you call it? How much money, the, how much, what percentage of the dollar that goes into the food, the rancher or the, the person who grows the food is actually making, right? Yeah, so when I started out in 1972, uh, when I bought my first cows, we were getting about 68% of the consumer dollar back to the farm and ranch gate, back to the producer who finished the animal and sold it to the packer. So, hold on. So that means that if you spend a dollar on food, at the consumer does. 68% right. of that goes to the rancher. Correct. Or, the or, ones, or the rancher is making 68% yeah, of them. And, and they're the ones that have got the investment. They, they got the land, they've got the... The risk. They got the huge amount of risk. Huge risk. Huge risk. And, and, and so they were getting about 68%. And they were doing okay back in those days. They were, they, were, they were okay. Their kids wanted to come back. The families were pretty stable. But then as the meat packer became more and more concentrated to the point they are today, four packers control 85% of the steer and heifer market. Now they've reduced that percentage down during COVID as low as 27%. Currently about 37% of the final consumer dollar goes back to the farm and ranch gate. It's unsustainable. There's no way you can pay the bill. And the guys in the middle from the meat packer through the retailer are taking the money through abusive market power and monopoly. Purely, that's it. And they don't deserve it. They got the private equity now that's investing in all these companies and they're demanding returns that are unreasonable. And, and they're destroying the ranch. They're destroying the communities that the ranchers are coming from. And rural America is, is like a third world country. It's yep. terrible. Oh, yeah. And so I was just listening to a book on the way up here, and it was talking about the, the, the demise and fall of civiliz civilizations throughout the past. It's very common to see what happens. Is you eventually, right now in, a, in America, we have all this land still. Right? They were, it looks like unlimited amounts of land, but it's not. It's a finite resource. Right? right, and we're producing food for a number of people. We're still outproducing that food, the 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 people that are there to a certain extent. Now, you, you're not really hard to tell because we're we have imports coming in. We're importing all this cheap food, right? Right. So th it's kind of mixing up that we're a net food importer. We're a net food importer, which means he means we're we're actually importing more food than we're exporting. Correct. At some point, if you continue down the road of not worrying about your resources. Oh, we're just unlimited. We're just going to use it forever. Don't worry about the rancher. He can't make it, but that's okay. At some point, that crashes, and then and then who has control? Well, then, well, then it's chaos because everyone's hungry and can't get food. And and, and the and somebody can dictate the price, right? Well, and the, and the big companies are gone. They leave. They go somewhere else where they can they can strip mine, you know, the resources of a country. We're talking about companies like Cargill, the biggest independent corporation on the planet. Uh, we're talking about Tyson, uh, JBS, already a multinational, all of them multinational. And, and multinational searching... means they're not here in the U.S. They're multinational, meaning they're yeah. their main. Well, they may be they may be headquartered here in the U.S. Right. In the case of, of Tyson and Cargill, JBS is headquartered out of Brazil. But these are companies that search the world for the cheapest of everything to sell into the highest consuming market, which today is the U.S., but not for long. If we can't continue to create the wealth from the soil and through agriculture, we look at the amount of debt we have right now. Mm -hmm. The only hope of paying it is through production, mm -hmm. production from the land. And we are destroying the resource. We're letting the soils wash away and blow away. David Montgomery wrote a book. That might be the one you're talking about, about civil, how civilizations fail. 
and we're on our way big time right now. So as a consumer, trying to find the best like price for a product, we're very good at that in America, but we tend to not think about the long-term consequences of that, especially if you live in a, in a city where you're, well, I don't even know if that's true. E even in the country, you try to make your dollar last longer. So you're trying to, yeah. you're really shopping for that best price, not thinking about the long-term consequence. And then we can, we can actually vilify our ranchers because they're harming the environment or something. Right. And, and at this, and without thinking what you're destroying is something you will have to pay for. And we're not paying them for their stewardship, for their care of the environment and of the land and the environment. In fact, we're running them off. We've lost 44% of our ranchers since 1980. But this whole price shopping consumerism is what's made the Walton family so wealthy. And, and the Walmart Absolutely. and Walmart Absolutely. is so big. It, and, it's a mentality too. Right, we, and we gotta get over it. I mean, it, it's self-destructive. It will be the end of us if we don't recover and decide it's better to support our community and help our neighbor and love one another rather than pick each other's pockets. That's right. So I always say that ranching, just by doing what they do, just by them making a living, they actually create and protect habitat for wildlife. For, for our resources right out here. Just by doing what they do, they protect that, but they also create something else and that's community. And we can get into that enormously, but that has changed drastically over the years. Yeah, the communities are gone. We, we've, we've pillaged for so long that these small communities have just simply died. Main streets are dead, they're boarded up, and, and there's a Walmart within maybe 30 miles away. And now there's dollar stores showing up. So, you know, I always talk about Walmart kills and consumes the prey. Dollar stores eat the decaying remains. And when it's, it's done, it's done. Leftovers kind of thing. That's right. So one to end on, I remembered what I was gonna say. So what is the solution, or at least one of the solutions? Because I've always said, it's not subsidy. You can't subsidize ranchers out of their, their issues. You can't, there's no program that's gonna pay them money enough to make them come out of this. It's, it's a solutions have to be that ranchers are able to make more money with the land they have, enough money to where they have the incentive to keep that land and do what they do. So well, one's, what's one way they can do this? Well, we, we know even St. Paul said that husbandman, the rancher, the livestockman, absolutely must be the first partaker of the fruits. Now we've given him the leftovers, the crumbs. Mm -hmm. He can't continue to be the husbandman that we want him to be and need him to be if we're going to succeed as a civilization. And so we have to take what steps are necessary to increase the income at the farm and ranch gate and reward that husbandman, that land steward, with enough of the consumer food dollar that he can really do his job and his kids want to come back. Because it's more than just wanting to do your job. I mean, people say, well, ranching is the reward because it's, it's such an amazing lifestyle. It is. But when you have this, the stress of, of the risk and the loss and the, like, I may not make it this year kind of a thing, and you're in a bad mood and your, your kids are, see that and they don't want to do that. No. You know? And that's totally the way it is. But totally the way it is. You got two jobs in town, too. So mm -hmm. now, now you're, actually, now you're mm -hmm. actually doing all that work you used to do full time. You're doing it part time and trying to pay, you know, the bills with the two jobs in town. Yeah, so one of the ways that ranchers can move into making more of this money is selling directly to consumer, right? That's right. So how, how did they start going from where, where they're at to that? Is there... Well, and this is good. This made the full circle back to the cheap ground beef. They can't compete with that. So when they're no selling way. direct, there's no way they can compete with $2.50 ground beef. And, but, but, and the other problem is, if you're a rancher in Montana producing 400 calves a year off of your cows, you can't sell that many direct. Mm -mm. I mean, and plus you don't have the infrastructure to slaughter and process that many animals. I mean, we've depended on these big, massive slaughterhouses for too long and we've lost our local regional infrastructure. So we need to rebuild that. So the first step of this actually is to bring back community in and uh, I don't know, re in, rejuvenate the food market in this country is by understanding from the consumer that when they see this super cheap beef, it's actually killing their local rancher. Right, right, and, and it's, it's, it's sort of a lost leader in some ways too, because the average price at the retail uh, uh, level right now, according to USDA meat price spreads, is 831 a pound. 
and any rancher that could get a fair share of 831 a pound would be doing okay. But that's not possible because they are, again, a cost to be reduced and they get, they get the crumbs. And, and, and it's all about the abusive market power in the middle. We've got to break it up. So when you see, and also when you see like uh, the production of a new slaughterhouse, people have this idea that if it's out of sight, it's out of mind, right? right? right. Oh, we don't want to buy oil. We don't want to extract oil here. We want to extract it from Russia and pay them billions of dollars. Right, kind right, of the mindset, right. right? Same thing with beef. These local communities are now trying, attempting to build butcher, uh, what do you call them? Well, but, well, slaughter facilities. Yeah, slaughter, slaughter facilities. Processing plants. And, and I love Temple Grand, and she says, she's the animal welfare expert out of CSU. Uh, but she says, look, it's slaughter. Yeah, you're it's killing. It's not harvesting, it's right. processing. You're killing an animal. Fine. Yeah. And you should know that because you need to respect what the animal has provided you and given you. Don't underestimate, don't understate what that animal is actually given in its death in feeding you. For you. Yeah. And it's, oh. it's also taking, it's almost a step closer to personal responsibility for what you're doing. It's like right. hunting where you're, you're killing an animal and then you're consuming it. Right. It, it's something different in you when you do that because you're actually, you understand the responsibility you had in the death. Right. When you're out of sight, out of mind, and you never understand it, and you don't want to say the words and all that kind of stuff, absolutely. It takes it out of the responsibility. So 50 people from uh, Linger in Denver, a restaurant that we sell to, get on a big tour bus and they come out to St. Francis and we actually do a slaughter just for them to observe. And so you've got 50 people on a kill floor on our ranch in St. Francis, Kansas, and they've got, they're young people mostly. Mm -hmm. And they come down and they watch this slaughter and they absolutely, no one was offended. And they had a, such a deep understanding when it was over, of the respect for that animal and the humane treatment that it's shown during this whole process. Mm -hmm. I mean, this animal didn't get on a truck and travel 500 miles to a big slaughterhouse where they got off and met 6,000 animals they'd never seen before. And I mean, this is as good as it can possibly get. And so now when you go to Langer and Denver and you eat, hey, where's your meat come from? It's pretty amazing because mm -hmm. they've been there and they've seen it and they know the difference and they are not price shopping, trying to beat us up on the price and their customers are happy, they're profitable, and it's such an, an energy-filled gathering place. So the, the way they've designed their whole, their whole uh, venue there in, in that restaurant. So we've started out with the fact that you may not know that you're eating pink slime, but we've actually gotten into the heart of an issue here, and that's what I, I really wanted to focus on, is do you know where your beef comes from? Where your meat comes from? Because it's, it's kind of difficult to know if you just go into the grocery store. And these, these issues behind it, so, sometimes I say you've got to move into the future because there's certain things you can't bring from the past and replace. We're not going to just wipe out all civilization and put right. buffalo back on the prairie. But there are things you can do for our future because our future is in jeopardy in this country as far as food production, which I would say is <laughs> pretty important. So. When you're, when you're talking about the livelihood of the rancher and the community and the sense of community that you can gain from doing, having ranchers directly sell to somebody. They need somebody to sell to. They need a way to do it. They need a way to butcher the animal. All of these things are happening right now, but they're difficult. Um, how, can, how can somebody find somewhere to buy beef from a local rancher? Well, you, know? you, you kind of need to just probably get on the internet and do some research. And, and if you know, if you have access right now and you can help others with that information, that's gonna be really important. But the fact is you cannot go to one of the large grocery stores and get anything that resembles what we've talked about in, right. in, in the quality and the rancher and the environment, all of that benefiting. And you, you talk about, well, we, we aren't gonna bring the buffalo back, but we can most certainly bring the cows back. Right. And we need to do that in a big, big way with good policy because these cows heal the environment. They sequester a lot more carbon if that's what you're worried about. And they improve soil health. They improve the health of people uh, through the food that you eat that these cows produce. Think about the miracle of a ruminant animal. An animal that can go out there and eat that bale of hay, that can go out there and eat that grass and turn it into high protein food for us to eat. Mm -hmm. That's a gift. Well, and, and I, 
am beginning to get to that understanding where um, of how, I guess, because I have been a, a, to that point before, how the cow is actually taking the place in the environment of the buffalo. Exactly. It, it doesn't look the same, and I know you're, you know, people are worried about that, but it is actually, it's doing the same things for the soil, it's doing the same things for the earth, and it produces food directly to the consumers of this country and the world. Well, so. the cows are nicer. And cows are a lot nicer. I've been around some <laughs> buffalo. <laughs> Easier to handle, too. Right, right. Yeah. Well, hey, man, thank you so much Absolutely. for talking to me. Kennedy. I appreciate it. It was my pleasure. It was fan, fan, fascinating. It's a fascinating subject, and it's really something that's near and dear to my heart. So I appreciate you talking. Absolutely. Anytime.